Hello, I'm hello, here. and welcome. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for being here today. I'm really excited to be here with Ronald Wimberly, who was got overly excited and started early. So that's fine. We're just going to start again here. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure if I was counting down or what. I was waiting for numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Uh, hello, welcome, uh, welcome to the Autonomous Creative, and I am here with Ronald Wimberly. I met Ron back in, I want to say, 2007-ish, uh, at a fancy restaurant where we're being treated to a fancy dinner by a French publisher. Those were the days. <laughs> Later, I discovered his first big release, Sentences, The Life of M.F. Grimm, and that exact same publisher put us together to work on my book, Trish Trash, which later didn't happen, but we did it for a few years. We worked on early drafts and things together. Um, and I remember one of the first times we met talking about Trish Trash and kind of getting ready uh, to start on that. Um, I learned a hard lesson that life with Ron would always be interesting and challenging. We are talking about roller derby on Mars, you know, silly stuff like that. And somehow Ron started bringing in all of these deep cultural references and I'm struggling to follow all this stuff and not look like an idiot. And I remember he brings up the Decameron and I'd actually read the Decameron 10 years earlier or so, but I remembered nothing about it. And I was like trying to pretend <laughs> that I still remembered what was in it while well, he's like, you know how this, that, and the connection between the camera and what we're talking about and blah, blah, blah. And it was fun. It was inspiring, but it was also kind of scary to get in such deep intellectual waters so quickly. So we've since had many more conversations, some deeper than others, never predictable, never boring. And so I'm really excited to see what we get into today. So Ron, welcome. Hey, how's it going, Jessica? <laughs> I don't even remember <laughs> that. I'm like, what is no, that, I mean, that possibly talking about? I have no idea. It's something about journey, you know, love story. I don't know what it was. Anyway, mm. I, I I honestly was like just trying to think. I have read that, right? I have. I know I read that. What's it about again? Uh, yeah, that sounds so. smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I'm gonna go with the myth, though. Let's go. Yeah, I don't buy that for a minute. I mean, I definitely would not have thought of that again if you hadn't brought it up. It was you, not me. <laughs> Um, so let's just start with a few sort of background questions because I know there are going to be new people here who haven't met you before and I want to get everybody kind of up to speed on what you're doing right now. Um, what do you do all day right now? What are you working on? Right now, um, I'm working on um, film and animation mostly. Like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm starting ramping up production on a short that I'm working on. Uh, I'm developing another short on the side and I'm developing like a, uh, like a couple television show pitches, one of them animated and one of them partially animated. So that's- The pitches are or the shows are gonna be animated? The shows, yeah. That's okay. what I'm working on right now. Um, a lot of writing, some drawing. I'm about to start doing a lot more drawing because uh, in the next week, I'll be starting the storyboard process on one of the shorts. So that's what I'm working on right now. I didn't know you were working on shorts. What are these? What are they? Um, well, one of them I, I can't say too much about. Um, okay. But one of them uh, is I was, you know, I worked with Mark Osborne, um, his director. He did uh, Kung Fu Panda, the first film, and um, the the real Kung Fu Panda. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, he he was, you know, I was just talking about life and my career. We had been talking about different things. Like um, I had, I had kind of put, you know, people had reached out for me to do, to work on several projects. And I was kind of like, yo, I just want to, like, I want to move past being one project. They were looking for me as a designer and, and I was like, I can do, I can do this. Like I have the vision to do more than just like kind of this particular portion. And he's like, well, I started out like my short is essentially how I was able to show people that I could direct. So I was like, all right, well, let me, let me go ahead and um, do that. And I was like, I don't even know. He's like, well, I, we had been talking about this New York Times cartoon that I did that like they, they couldn't put out. And he's like, oh, that's a great story. You should do that. And um, and it started to echo the Lighten Up uh, strip, which was a comic that I did. Um, it was on Medium. It was the Nib, uh, and um, 
<laughs> it just started to seem like that. I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to do this. And I reached out to uh, a buddy. Um, I reached out to Titmouse, you know, Chris Pronowski, Chris P over at Titmouse. And we talked about it and he was like, yeah, well, you know, we can do that. So that's my production partner. And um, yeah, I, that's what I've been working on for the first quarter of this year. And um, so it's related to lighten up. So we're going to get into this in a minute. I'm going to get a, for anybody who doesn't is not familiar with this strip. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Lou, just put the link in the chat if you're interested in checking it out. But um, but the the short you're working on is is related to that. Yeah, well, I would say structurally and kind of like how it both structurally and how it um, how it came to be, you know, because like uh, lighten ups, you know, I had talked to Matt Boers uh about all right so let's uh let me give some background here so before people in case people are not familiar with this so lighten up is a sort of a one pager maybe two to three pages if it were printed but it's kind of one piece right one strip like and it's about your experience of working on she hulk uh and it actually is about my experience doing just three maybe three or four pages in a the death of wolverine like a, a jam book that had a bunch of different artists in it oh um, okay yeah. because there's because she helped comes up at the end i think i was thinking about yeah, that of course which I was you prior, on that. yeah yeah like i just used yeah. it as a foil <laughs> right but in any case it's a it's a situation where you had um you were doing coloring as well as drawing on the strip and you mm -hmm. had colored a character with a sort of medium brown skin mm -hmm. color and your editor came back and said, can you lighten her up? Yeah. And, yeah. and gave you sort of like a hex code. You did this really cool thing with the color hex codes and mm -hmm. which hex code belongs to what and what does it mean to be quote unquote black or quote unquote white? What is it, you know, and have you ever, and then you go into deep waters with, I've never had a black editor, you know, mm -hmm. at a mainstream comics company and all this other mm -hmm. stuff. And it feels so related and so connected to the whole story of your, tabloid paper lab. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, I don't know how it fits into, but you have this other book, um, Black History in Its Own Words, that mm -hmm. is also was also in the nib and sort of feels part of that whole story. Is that mm -hmm. sort of um, accurate? I don't know. I mean, I guess it's part of the, it's part of just like what the, the work that I do. Lab kind of, you know, I guess I have two two types of work, right? Like I have the work that I'm just like, kind of exploring um, just stories, stories that I want to tell. And then I have like work that's kind of critical that I feel like I have to do sometimes to either give context to um, my work and work in general, almost like maybe trying to cultivate um, a type of readership, you know, um, or criticism around work in general, like maybe in a way, in a way it's, you know, like kind of, giving you know advocating for people to read my work <laughs> or to read work the way that i think will will make my work more valuable <laughs> culturally um so uh and lighten up would fit into the second half of that because i mean it, it and the reason why i compared it to this other short is because um not only because it's about sort of formally what I'm doing, um, there's like a political aspect, you know, that that kind of intersects with the formal, um, but also because like, and this is part of the formal aspect of uh, this recent one more so than lighten up, which is like it's another sort of looking at looking at myself, which is like, um, yeah, Matt Boers was like kind of you know it was hit like he he saw the value in the lighten up strip and osborne mark osborne saw like the um va value in this kind of telling this times new york times story and mark osborne was your editor there no mark osborne is was a director um he's a friend and i was working on one of his films um, okay and you know we you know we just started we had we had met in Columbus, Ohio. He was there to as a guest, I think, at um, the comic convention that's there, and um, we were both at a dinner, 
And I'm like, this guy's just a really nice guy. <laughs> this guy's a really cool guy. I like him a lot. And we kind of been friends ever since. And I worked on um, I worked on one of his projects. But, you know, we keep up and we talk about uh, we talk about the difficulties or the complexities or the problems and the paradoxes in wanting to tell stories and um, tell stories that at the very least aren't or, or doing maybe to doing the least possible uh, reproduction of pernicious ideas that are embedded in aesthetics, right? So, and yeah, and he was like, let's do this time story, which to me at, uh, or you should do that because it'll be interesting. It'll be a great short. As a short. Yeah. As a film like, short. Yeah. How, how that rhymed with my experience of lighting up was, is that like, it was, um, you know, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about my homie Mark or, you know, uh, Matt either, but like it, it was interesting to what I think, I mean, they're two white men, right? Um, and it meaning was, it, Matt Bores and yeah, Mark and Mark. Osborne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I remember on lighten up early in the process, Matt was like, Oh, you should put a picture, you know, like you should put a picture of yourself in the story. And I've always mm -hmm. been kind of like, um, even at, even at that early point in working, I kind of was a little bit conflicted about the um the value of like my identity mm -hmm. in, in you know in publishing but also in terms of like um like the epistemological value like the value in an argument you know what i mean like yeah so i didn't want to put myself <laughs> i didn't want to put like my face there you know um, yeah well so this this actually um, gets to something that I what I was thinking about as I was doing research for this interview and going back to, through our long history of being friends and stuff. And I remember, uh, so I'm looking up your website and stuff now and seeing what you have there and looking at your current links and stuff. And your current website is called, you know, Ronald J. Wimberly. Hmm. And, um, that's very, very clear. But I remember back when I met you, everything was deep high hmm. and, you had about 15 emails. I never knew which one was the one that was going to get to you. Too many emails. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was, you know, there's Grattanin, which I still don't really get. And there's mm. you know, Trismegistus and like all yeah. this other, you had all these names and things. And even on your website of today, there's no picture of you, I think. No, it's just like that, um, it's that one drawing. Cause I don't really use yeah. it. I don't, <laughs> I feel like no one, I don't really want anyone to contact me. Like I, the people who can contact me, I feel they can contact me. Like, I really don't want anyone to find me, you know, but I feel like I need to have that out there, you know, like, and I've done okay. I support myself rather well without people being able to find me. So like, I kind of like it that way, but to well, your people point, can find you on yeah. social media. No problem. I mean, they right. can find you and be in touch with you if they need to be. And I get that not wanting your emails out there or whatever. I completely get that, but it's not just that. It's also, there's these like sort of alter ego layers mm. kind of, um, and I and I feel like maybe that's what was getting challenged in that moment where he's like, why don't you put yourself in the strip? Mm. And you, you know, then you have to kind of be out there just as yourself and and talking about your own personal experience in some actually, way. Actually, I don't I don't see it as being uh, uh, having that image out there being myself. I see it as um, having a an image that people can they will they will garner some sort of a an idea or a value as a symbol like me being mm -hmm. like a black figure in that space like a black male figure means like oh this guy knows what he's talking about like this is the real rap like it's coming from a black dude so like he knows what he's talking about and you about. don't think but you don't want to claim that authority you don't want you don't think that because uh at least partly because you're a black dude that you do have that authority or no i'm gonna say the authority would be in like the truth not yeah, in, yeah, but is that not part of the truth? <laughs> no, I would say no. I mean, the the truth. I mean, it would be. I would say probability wise, like I have a a higher probability of maybe seeing some things, you know, than someone who doesn't necessarily have my body or my experience. Certainly, mm -hmm. but not not 
not necessarily. You know what I mean? So, so it's too much of a shortcut, kind of like when somebody sees your face or, um, or associates also, you as a physical person. Uh, no, I mean, like in the in the so for so I think it's first of all, I think it's, there's no way to escape it, right? There's no way to escape mm. what it is. But like I I saw the I saw putting my picture or like a um cipher, you know what I mean? For me, that kind of expressed that I am a black body, and if you look at lighting up. It's very, I come in and out, you know, like there's some that are more like representative of what I look like. But the first one is li literally just a silhouette where you see my color purposefully. Right. Because like that is that's what the value of it was. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. um, for better or worse, that's what the value of it was for, like, say, um, uh, like a liberal publication, you know, like the New York Times. It's like, OK, well, there's value in. All right. When there are uprisings in the street uh there's and and your paper you know you want to you want to seem fair or you want to like it's black history month there's value you know what i mean like um if it imagine if it was black history month and some publication reaches out and asks me to do something and i'm like great thanks but don't let anyone know that i'm black <laughs> they're gonna be like wait a minute but the whole point you know <laughs> we're reaching out to you is so that you know um yeah it, it, but it feels like tokenism uh i mean i don't i'm not sure what tokenism means <laughs> like in, in the case well, of i mean this, I, I, yeah. i'm just going from my own experience as a mm. woman in comics and and you know I, the the duality of of being situations where people are asking me to have to per take part in something both because i am me and i have done the work that i have done and I'm, it's very specific and very you know it, it is what it is. It's it's my body of work, but also because I'm female, you know, mm -hmm. because they don't have enough women involved in whatever it is, and they need a female voice there. And um, so it's always, for me at least, it's always mixed. It's never a thing where it's 100% either thing. You know, it's not 100% that that the um, that I'm there. They they wouldn't ask, you know, go walk down the street and just get a comics woman comics reader and get her on mm -hmm. this panel. It's, they're asking me because of my work, but at the same time, would they have asked me if I weren't female? Mm. Yeah. Do, but and I, they need to foreground that. Yes. But there's also sometimes I, I, you know, it seems to me that the, that sort of value structure could be counterproductive to the work that I'm trying to do, not always, but sometimes, you know? Um, and like, so for instance, uh, say if even, it just becomes something difficult to work around sometimes, you know what I mean? And in that case, I was like, mm, I wanna get this point across, you know what I mean? And I don't wanna get the point across in like a way that seems uh, partisan in a way that disrupts sort of just like the reason you know because like yeah, i think no, the I totally argument get it. i think the argument is airtight you know what i mean like regardless you know what i mean if matt had made that argument i think it would have been airtight you know what i mean mm -hmm. um matt so, being my white husband just in case anybody's wondering right 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 you know what i mean i think it would have been an airtight you know like and also that's the type of work you know um speaking of we do similar or thinking about like formally i want the form to do the work too and that's something that I don't know if people are even thinking of. And by the way, I feel like that cartoon I learned. So yeah, so this meaning short, lighten up, lighten up. I feel like lighten uh -huh. up. There are things that I'm doing with this animated short that I'm trying to. It's another experiment to see if like it's even if it even makes sense for me to make these types of uh, things because like lighten up. Most of the time when people talk to me about lighting up, I feel like the point of the cartoon was completely missed. So, and really? I, I, yes. And I feel like part of it, um, part of it is because of like how, you know, you know, it's just, it's difficult. So like, I think one of the lessons about being an artist that I've learned over these years is just like, you put stuff out you mean things sometimes it's inconsequential to what people get from it 
And like, if it's just something that's like capital A art, then it's not that big a deal. But if it's like art that is also somewhat of a, you know, an essay in this case, <laughs> right? Then like, that's kind of disheartening, <laughs> you know? Right, so if this is your chance uh, with the people who are here today to tell them, what is it actually about? What would you say? Mm. Oh, I mean, personally, I would, personally, I don't see any value in like dictating what the meaning of it is. Because Except that you've, because you just feel like it didn't come through, like you, whatever yeah, I, you were trying to do was. Well, per personally, what I would hope is that it would make people kind of like think about things. And I didn't get, I didn't get that vibe. Like I got, sometimes I got a lot of vibes where it's like, you know, well, my hashtag or my um uh hex code is blah, 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 right? And I'm this, that, and the third, you know? And I'm like, all right. <laughs> I wasn't really, I wasn't really trying. I mean, I in a way I'm trying to destroy, I, I wanted to smash. Okay, here it is. I wanted to get people to think about how ridiculous it is anyway. You know what I mean? Like, and how unrelated, um the color of that character was to what that character could be, particularly in that, um, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, and, and the construct yeah. construct of race, yeah. how it's working, how it's creeped its way into the editorial process. You know what I mean? Um, not, yeah. I wasn't trying to give people more space to sort of project the concept of race onto themselves. You know what I mean? Like, well, I thought the really <laughs> interesting piece to me was how you um, talk, you talked about, all these different, you know, what is, again, what is black? What does it, you know, the color, the hex code that you would be right now on the video screen is nothing like black. It's not black, right? It's a nice brown color. It's not, it doesn't, doesn't relate to zero, 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 zero hex code. Um, and then the, uh, but then in other light, you would be other, same as me, you know, like they'd have different colors depending on what light you're in. As an artist, you're always thinking about what is the color I'm actually seeing and not some kind of dictated, mm -hmm. and that, to me related to um, the, you know, contingency of race, like race only means something in, in certain contexts, you know, it means different things in different contexts. Um, and I thought that the coda about She-Hulk, the reason I thought it was that She-Hulk, you know, from when you're working on that, um, you have a thing where there's several different panels showing She-Hulk drawings with different greens, she's green, and she's different greens in different panels. and you point out that nobody complains about this. <laughs> she changes color depending on who's, you know, uh, coloring and depending on the light conditions and so on. And because she's green, no one cares and no one comments on it. Which I thought, for me, that was that was the meaning of it. Was really uh, to question this whole the whole idea of how color can be used as a you know to pin you down to some kind of meaning that you don't really. Well, that, you yeah, don't but, get behind or potentially don't get behind. Well, that, yeah, but like, yeah. So like when I, also putting two things next to each other to maybe create some confusion. So like when you say black, like you don't really, like it, it could be, it's a politic. Like it's not, you know, like I don't, I yeah. never, you know what I mean? Like, and um, the value of the, the value of, you know, it, that's part of the reason why I don't want to sit here and like try to explain it. And like, maybe I failed at, the comic doing what I intended to do with the comic. Um, because I really like if I could, I guess if I could just like, pin down sort of what I'm trying to provoke in a phrase, like in a poem, I'd be Saul Williams, right? But I'm not, you know, what I mean? like I'm, I'm making the cartoon, I'm making the comic so that it can do that work, which is really just to get people to think about like, oh, well, you know, all right, well, this color, uh, the skin color of this character has some sort of other symbolic meaning to these people. And it's related to like the value of it, no pun intended. You know what I mean? Um, and like, uh, how does that relate to the history of um, how these figures have been depicted? Like, you know. Um, right, yeah. So that's all. Yeah. Well, I mean, but whatever. Like, so this next thing that I'm working on, I'm, I have an opportunity to kind of like explore, um, 
explore like how how even that work and works like that fit into like sort of the space that I've been in. So sort of like, you know, what is it, you know, what does it mean to try to produce this type of work? What does it mean to feel some type of way when you can't do it? And it's like, how does that relate really to, you know, struggles or whatnot? Like a lot of it is funny because I had started working on it and then, um, uh, is it Olufemi? Uh, hold on for a second. So I was, um, it's going to really just, uh, up <laughs> right now. Are you <laughs> actually I, Googling right in the middle of your interview? Yeah, because I want to get, I want to <laughs> get this guy's name right. Um, yeah. Olufemi Otaiwo did this. He wrote this article in, uh, the philosopher elite capture and epistemic, epistemic deference, you know? So like, um and it and i read it right as i was working on this script and i was like okay this is exactly sort of like all right this is going to be in response or like in you know dealing with some of these ideas uh and i'll give you guys a link on here it's a good article Great. And if you're coming here later to this, then we will share that link also in our show notes. Oh, there it is. Yeah. And I mean, um, so yeah, just some, yeah, complex ideas. I don't want, I don't even want to talk about it. It's like, you can watch, you can read that article or whatever. I'm not saying we're saying Okay. We'll, we'll read the article, but this is, right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the, you, but you I know. mean, this all, it, it, the, this sort of discomfort with pinning down meaning and with dictating meaning and mm -hmm. and allowing lots of room for interpretation but also having lots of ideas that you want people to pick up on that seems like something that's really a theme through your work i mean i look i hope so i, I don't feel like <laughs> i don't know yeah <laughs> all yeah, right let's go I, back because i want to tell i want to talk a little life. bit about huh hope it's a theme in my life is hopefully coming out yes. in my work you know yeah no i mean it's it i think it relates to this thing i was referring to of not being able to figure out you know what your email was or whatever mm. it's sort of like you <laughs> want people to figure you out and <laughs> you know like i kind of want to get i kind of I don't, I don't know if I want people to figure me out. I, I don't know. You know what? I have a lot. I place a lot of value in just, I, I don't know. I feel like I've, I've, I, in my life, I've gotten a lot of value from just coming into contact with things that made me think deeply and take the time to think about things and like maybe yes. put me on and think laterally about other things. And like, um, that's what I want to do. Like, I, I feel maybe when I was right out of school or like when I was young and like making art, I was like, OK, well, this is a way for people to know me. Like, you know, OG, young, young Ronald Wimberly was like, yeah, you know, like if I keep making this stuff, like it's a way to connect with people and they'll get to know me. And I feel like I'm I don't know if that's like uh, an object. Well, I mean, I think this is something, again, this is something that I associate with all of my, you know, many times hanging out with you that like things will like this article will come up in a conversation because you found you found this through a path of inquiry. You've gone someplace and you kind of want people to follow you. I remember talking to you one time about um, teaching mm. and whether you would want to teach mm. and um, you expressed sort of what's the word I would look for here, like flabbergastedness or something about the lack of curiosity among students that you you mm. saw at school um, when you were there that, you know, a, a teacher would sort of offhandedly toss off a name to you of, you should go check out so-and-so the way teachers do, right? And you'd be like, all right, and you write it down and you'd go look it up and find out who that person is. And then you'd read the bibliography and you'd find out who their influences are. And then you'd go from there and you continue to look for stuff. And um, you're not an, a classic autodidact in the sense of like, you know, that's the only world you live in, but that's, you have a very um, 
curious mind and you're very interested in what people are saying and you want to be able to put these ideas together and then you embed them. And this is, it gets back to the first thing I said in my intro, which I know is a little embarrassing, this whole thing about the camera on, but it's like, you're bringing that into a conversation about roller derby on Mars because it makes sense to you. Mm. And I was trying to follow you. I was trying to follow your train of associations, mm. you know? And I think there's moments, it seems to me that there are moments when it clicks and people see what you're trying to put together. And, and that's, you know, when you feel great about what you're doing with your work and everybody else is like, wow, you know, Ron just blew my mind. And there's other times when you think they're not following, like they're not getting the thing I'm trying to, to the path I'm trying to lay down for them, the, the breadcrumbs that I wanna have people follow. I mean, maybe it's more just like, um, maybe it's maybe, but I mean, maybe it's like, uh, one myself i'm trying to get away from any sort of i'm trying to get away from that like i'm i want to get to a place where i don't know two things are happening at least um one of them is okay well how does my work um how do i interact with like society or my community with my work in a meaningful way one Two, um, how do I have a healthy relationship with how my work is received? <laughs> you know, and the and the uh, production and the production of my work. You know what I mean? Like so. Um, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I haven't really worked this out very far down the line, but it seems from the bit that I've thought about it that it's unhealthy to fixate on how work is received. You know, it, it seems like it's not a look, you know what I mean? Like you don't wanna, it's not something to focus too much on. But at the same time, um, I do see, I don't know, like, I, you know, I'll go to a movie and I'll see like, you know, or whatever you see like a, a Star Wars or like a, marvel movie or something and you're just like wow this part of it is because it is just like the voice of the dominant culture just manifesting like it, it the dominant culture is producing this thing that happens to kind of like vibrate with it you know what i mean like it is it is it's giving you the aesthetics of like what the dominant culture is and part of that you see it and you're like wow this is very efficient at connecting with people but also it's like these people live in the world that's producing this it's not like it's not transgressive or you know doing anything like that it's just like really the flower it is the flower of our society right <laughs> and then the people are coming and looking at it and they're like wow look at it it's amazing i'm impacted by this it's like yeah you're you're impacted by this but like also you in the world that you live in has created this like this is the this is what it is and so i mean as an artist maybe like this is uh a back like backwards i'm not always kind of like in my mind thinking what i've just said sometimes i'm just looking at it and i'm like wow it's whoever the people who put this together they're really good at sort of um like kind of pied pipering these people but it's like i don't think it's necessarily that i think it's moving in both directions you know so like i think it's good to remember that and also if i'm creating something where i'm like okay i'm trying to embed some things into uh i'm trying to embed some things that are maybe uh either like sort of like problematizing that that world or that those aesthetics or even you know um like kind of fighting against it or i i i see as like a response like a counter to it um then to kind of have this to put it out there and, you know, uh, I think I just need to be more patient with just like, well, let it, you know, just put it out, just like put it out and see how people, you know, like, um, and it's great. Sometimes people come up to you and they're like, oh, I love this. And you did this, that, and the third. And it's like, I just need to have more self-control or like, or be more, I think, have space to accept that this is, um, impacting or like mean something to people without sort of like kind of feeling some type of way 
about how what it exactly means to them <laughs> you know what i mean just like kind of okay yeah all right that's what you got from that then great like okay I'm, I'm out here and like i can support myself a little bit longer you know what i mean like great you know what i mean like let me not let me not get to you know but then also that's a high maybe, bar though that is really that's really hard it's really hard to not care you yeah. know what people are thinking about you you have a whole set of you've lived with this work for years mm. You know, you have a whole set of ideas that went into it and you had the experience of creating it and then to let that go and let it be whatever it is in the world. I mean, it's mm. asking a lot. Yeah, I mean, but life is about letting go. It's not that you're wrong, you're correct, <laughs> right. but yeah. it is hard. Yeah. yeah. Let's, uh, let's go back and talk a little bit about your path into comics mm. and now into working in film and animation because I think that's gonna be interesting to a lot of people here. Like, how mm. did that happen? Um, so you went to Pratt Institute, mm -hmm. right? Um, right? Were you doing well, comics when you were there? Um, towards the end, um, if this is about like my, you know, comics, uh, a buddy of mine, John David, put me on the comics. Like I, I, had, I had known about comics. You know, like you're an American of my age. You grew up like, you know, back in the day, we had newsstands. There was a thing called a newsstand. Like comics would be there. <laughs> um, in a, in a. Wow, school. man, you're older than I thought. Yeah, right. <laughs> like a 7 Eleven. <laughs> right. You know, those are fossils around. You know, like yeah. I was watching. I went to the newsstand too. What movie? Oh, I was watching the, um, the uh, documentary on Fran Libowitz. And she had like the, um, they have footage of New York back in the day. And like I remember when my great grandma, she used to take us up to like the church group would take us from DC up to New York for like little functions or whatever like shows and whatnot and i remember the first time we came in on the bus you know what i mean it's probably like eating fried chicken out of aluminum foil on the bus you know like <laughs> little, little snacks or whatever and looking out the window and seeing the yellow cabs and just seeing the air it's like as if like a swarm of seagulls except it was like newspapers you know what i mean like just the streets were covered, you know what I mean? Like newspaper flying everywhere, like trash, whatever, you know, this was eighties New York. Um, so anyway, my uncle used to read comics. I didn't know anything about comics, but I had seen comics around, you know, like he collected comics. I had Spider-Man pajamas. I had an incredible Hulk t-shirt. You know what I mean? Like it was around, there was a Hulk TV show. You know what I mean? Like there was stuff, but I hadn't really, yeah. the material um, I hadn't really, come in contact with, you know, only just sort of like the licensed products from IP that started in comics, right? So then uh, my homie put me onto it. I picked it up. I had been in the anime though before. And so like anime was something I was really into. And it was before people even called it anime. Like we don't, you know, it was like Japanese cartoons, Japanimation, like all the awful things we call this stuff back in the day, you know. But like, yeah, I was into that. And so then he took me to the comic book store and I was like, oh wow, cool. All right. Um, here's like some, you know, a lot of salacious imagery, you know what I mean? Like, and that was like, ooh, let me let me pick this up, you know, and I can read this, like <laughs> I can read this comic, you know, like um, but and yeah, picking up like apple seed and you know, uh picking up very early, like those colored. Um, Akira comics, you know, um, mm. what else? And yeah, I would get like the, the coolest things would be like these apple seed books that just had like lots of back material that was just talking about the world. You know, I was always into the weird things, like unconventional ways of telling story, like story being told outside of comics too. Like I always liked the collector cards from Marvel more than like the comics <laughs> you know because it was like a world so, it was it's an exploded world you know yeah so how did you go from this kind of sideways entry into being a comics reader to deciding yeah i'm gonna try to do this hmm. oh so right before i got to college i was reading um jordan crane's non and like that was how like, that happen I was just going to the comic book store. I was into things that looked cool and were fun and funky. I wasn't really, you know. What comic book store did you go to that you would get non? It was like, out, I think it was, I got to ask. What, a Big Planet or something? Mrs. Carlin or something. It was out, it was probably like out in Bethesda, Maryland or something. Or like, it was, was out in the suburbs Planet, of Maryland right? somewhere. I don't remember. I mean, it was a long time ago. Yeah. 
but like JD's mom would drive us out. Like we take our little bit of money and like go all the way out, you know, and go to this comic book store. And like back then you still had like, I feel like there were people, one of them still had people playing like with little pewter, you know, figurines doing something, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. It was gaming a wild, stuff. Yeah, 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 it was a wild place. But like, yeah, I would get my weird comics and like, and sometimes just based on the cover, I remember one just had like a, um, like a girl like with the cover with a reading non on the cover of non, and there was like a TV in the back. I still have this comic to this day. So that seed was planted. Got the prep, art direction. I didn't do art direction. Switched over to illustration. Um, uh, towards the end, maybe like junior year or maybe even senior year, I joined the Static Fish with um a bunch of the guys there julian um julian lytle ted lange the third um dan bandit he's called dan bandit now um did the backgrounds for uh adventure time um yeah a bunch of a bunch of people um miss who's also a cartoonist um like yeah we we you know and that's kind of how i got into comics as a culture and one of the first comics I did was kind of like, you know, influenced by um, uh, Dave Cho's Slow Jams. And the second one I did was Grattan Inn, and that was influenced by um, Arzak uh, and Ninjas. And the and like, I guess the second or third ninja explosion, uh, <laughs> the 80s ninja explosion. In the in the comics world, yeah. Well, so in the, the world gratuit, in general, Grattanin like, yeah. is gratuitous ninja, right? That's what yeah, it's yeah. short for, gratuitous yeah, ninja. Gratuitous so, ninja. are you were you aware that your ninjas were gratuitous and it was like extra ninjas we didn't need? Is that what that means? <laughs> yeah, the original the original idea was like, um, you know, a ninja is just a figure that there's so much embedded in just like the figure of a ninja, right? Like, and mm -hmm. oh my god, so like, yeah. Uh, I just wanted I wanted something to move. I wanted something to explode that I could draw that I didn't have to. Also, ninjas are silent. You know what I mean? Arzak was silent. So like my second comic, no words. I didn't want to have any words in it. I just wanted it to be movement and violence. You know, so like gratuitous ninja, meaning like I don't really need ninjas, right? Like, you know, I just I I put them in there like symbolic. I just like ninjas. I just like ninjas, like everything that they <laughs> everything. Everything and the more I got into them, the more I I was into them, right? Like at first it's just like literally that sort of ninja that kind of aesthetically comes from someone who's working on a stage, right? Like they're wearing all black. And then as I got deeper and deeper into it, like I'm like, wow, okay, so all right, some of these guys were farmers, like I'm starting to learn the history, you know, like, you know, yeah. And then I just is and it just got more and more into like it's still a, it's still a comic that the last comic i drew was a gratin in comic <laughs> you know what i mean like i you know 20 well i think later. it's sort of a, a, you know getting to what we're talking the first half of this interview we're talking about this uh you know various kinds of ways that you meanings you're struggling with or to either express or not and hope people get mm -hmm. them and don't i feel like there's this other strand of your work that and and then maybe split at the moment where you're you you're able to do in lab which is a tabloid magazine mm -hmm. you're editor of and you have your own articles in there and you're also uh convening a whole community of people with lots of thoughts about mm -hmm. culture in the world you're able to put all that stuff there and then you can make gratin in <laughs> mm -hmm. you know it's like you can kind of separate those two things in some mm -hmm. way yeah i mean that's what I, that's what i would like to do and as lab continues on you know, like the first issue of Lab was Lab Zero, right? It's kind of like uh, Lab is numbered um, sort of like uh, metaphorically, right? <laughs> it's, it's numbered. It's not. It's numbered in a way that has nothing to do with um, which one came out, it, you know, consecutively or whatever. It's got yeah, I know. I own them. Right, right. <laughs> so number zero is just kind of like it's a it's a statement of purpose um it's a lot of the you know you know it's a lot of it's essentially me putting all of my cards out on the table you know what i mean you can get, see all of like my sort of pinko uh tendencies you know what i mean like I, i'm just i'm kind of stating my subjective position um and also like kind of it's a key to all right well why you know like why are these you know like if you look at lab number zero you get an idea of like where lab came from you know it's in a way, yeah. though, it's almost like not an issue. It's not an issue 
looking, you know, like it's not what I want lab to be, you know, it's, it's, um, it's more kind of like what's underneath lab, you know? So it's a lot of essays. It's like the back matter of the, yeah. <laughs> the comics you're reading in the eighties or something like it's yeah. all the stuff you have to know in order to be able to read the future. Episodes. Yeah. Yeah. If you're curious about it. Right. Um, and as yeah. we move on, I'm just kind of like, all but right. With lab, wanna... that's a prerequisite. Like you're not going to be reading lab if you're not curious about it. Right. It's, well, it's so. challenging. Like the graphic design and the the density of the thinking and all the others, the size of it, just holding it, it's mm. huge. It's a challenging thing to grapple with. You gotta be committed. I mean, which I imagine yeah. is part of the point. Yeah, yeah, that is definitely part of the point. I mean, I just wanted to make. Also, it goes back to like non, right? Like I wanted to, you know, that's kind of like the blueprint for me. Like that's how I got into comics. Like when I was in college, you know. It was like ad busters, you know, non slow jams, um, mm -hmm. THB, you know what I mean? Your work, you know what I mean? Like these things that were kind of- Evan intimate. Dorkin, tell, uh, tell the Evan's Dorkin story. <laughs> tell the story. Dorkin, <laughs> this is like, thing. <laughs> Dorkin gave me the first comic of yours that I ever got and I still have it. Yeah. Which is like, very cool. But okay, yeah. so for everybody who does it, is not familiar with him, Evan Dorkin is a, uh, a long time indie cartoonist, self-publishing and, he had a comic called Milk and Cheese, and it's very uh, 90s and aughts, kind of snarky, sarcastic humor. Milk and Cheese are these bad boy, their, their dairy products gone bad. So here comes young Ron with his portfolio. Is that to his log line? convention? Dairy products yeah, gone dairy bad. Dairy products gone bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, which is good, right? Yeah very funny stuff and so you're showing your portfolio around at a comics convention or just meeting mm. people or something in the puck building i think it was or maybe mm. it was like a big apple comic con like it was during the years where new york comic con didn't exist like i think it's at one point you know the teamsters or something had put the kibosh on the big new york comic cons right and there were small ones anyway yeah i saw dorkin at one and you know i was talking i mean i hardly even knew you know, I had seen his covers more than I had seen it, the inside of his comics. But like a buddy of mine, Michael Barry, who we went together at Pratt too, um, he would take me to these comic cons because like I had never gone to comic book conventions. Like it was it was new to me, and he brought me around to meet all these different people. And like, and at one point, yeah, I met Evan Dorkin, and like we were talking, and I'm sure I was just like another kid who was like trying to do comics, and he was like, "All right, suit yourself." And so he hands me this card that it was like a get out of comics free card. <laughs> and I put it in my wallet and I kind of just like forgot about it. And then I don't know, like 10 years later, like the punchline hit me like, like a ton of bricks. <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah, just the, the way it's this, this relationship that could be very beautiful and fulfilling, but also just like, awful like you know i i figured out the meaning to that right it's designed card. like a monopoly card like the actual yeah. card is done like a mon exactly. monopoly yeah, card get out of jail that. free right, right right and yeah and like imagine you're at a comics convention you're looking at uh young people's portfolios and stuff and you're handing these cards <laughs> yeah. this is this is evan's sense of humor like he's a very yeah. funny guy but he obviously liked you because he gave you my comic he gave you comics yeah. to mm -hmm. look at because he mm -hmm. thought you know he wanted to encourage you at the same time which is also very evan yeah which i think is yeah it, it's I mean, which is also one of the beauties of comics, right? Like, imagine going to, I don't know, like a trade convention, like a Hollywood trade convention, and you bump into like, I don't know, Dorkin would be like the, like a Tarantino or something, you know what I mean? Like someone who's doing like kind of these, you know, like an underground or something. I mean, I don't mean to insult Dorkin or, you know, I don't really care about Tarantino, but I don't mean to insult <laughs> I don't mean to insult the, the, the comparison is not one to one. Let's just put it's it not that one way. to one. Yeah, yeah. Just like he's somebody making independent stuff. Right, there. right, right. And then, but I don't know. I, I mean, I'm gonna say Spike Lee because I know Spike Lee. Right, Spike Lee actually would. I think he would. He might do something like that. But he'd probably keep it moving. You know, because like, how many people yeah. want to talk to him? You know what I mean? Like, how many people want to? You know, also to put it in a sort of economic sense. Uh, the time of a cartoonist is way cheaper than the time of a filmmaker. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's messed up. To so say. true. So it's true. But I've often said stuff like, 
if you, like you're saying, you're going to like a film festival or something like that, with some exceptions, you're, you're not gonna write, say a Facebook group you're in or something like that and say, hey dudes, we're, I'm coming to, you know, the film festival in Riga. Mm. Does anybody know anybody where I can crash? Like, can mm. I sleep on your couch? Mm. And then Guillermo I mean, it's not that it doesn't like, happen, yeah, but sure, in I comics, this is, exactly. <laughs> like I know somebody there's, there's a kind of, um, and maybe it's less so now, I don't know, but it, mm. it's just a very collegial and, and, and helpful community mm. um, with, you know, the potential downside that 10 years later you get the punchline. <laughs> mm, right. Right. Yeah. Comics is, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of different things. I think it's got really high highs and really low lows. You know, so um, tell me in terms of high highs and low lows, tell me a little bit about Prince of Cats, your book, which is, um, I don't know how you want to describe it, but it is an adaptation of, I say, um, I say it's the B side. It's the B side of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. The B side of Shakespeare. Uh, that's yeah, good. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. it's a, it's an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, kind yeah. of, not really. Like it's, it's like it has some Romeo and Juliet. It's, in a, it's a take. Let's say it's a yeah. take on it. It's, yeah, it, it tells the more or less the arc of it. Right, right. The story, it, 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 the arc of Romeo and Juliet is some is happening kind of as a backdrop, and like it is a motif. It's a motif. Um, the Romeo and Juliet is a motif, and also sort of like the um. the era like well you know i don't know so it's set in the 80s in new york it's set in right? the 80s in new york like it, it kind of uh um a mashup of like sort of the decade uh where you're getting a little bit of that you know late 70s like warriors vibe you know like but it's one of the things i was gonna say the warriors I, yeah one of the things i sold it as is like yeah it's like five years after the warriors right which is like you know <laughs> Um, yeah, 80 blocks from Tiffany's is like, you know, I would have said, you know, like, um, it, it, you know, carries that sort of vibe forward a little bit. Um, yeah. And it, it, I wanted to get away from the sort of romantic narrative and kind of like the central romantic narrative of Romeo and Juliet and like explore Tybalt, um, Rosalind, who I don't even we don't really even see in the play. I think Rosalind might be like, she's probably at the party. Um, Juliet a little bit. Um, and yeah, Samson and Gregory. Uh, so. But so yeah. the story of it that I want to, I mean, the, um, the book is great and, mm -hmm. and beautiful and, and there's, it's really rich. There's tons, tons to get into in it, but I want to talk about the, um, the path of the actual book. Mm. Like, so you were, did it come out of working on sentences? I was working um, so on sentences is it where you were adapting somebody else's memoir, right? Sentences was, well, yeah, it was um, MF Grimm, underground MC, uh, wild story, part of Moss Island Zars, along with Doom, you know, who you may have heard of, um, legendary underground MC, MF Grimm. Uh, Percy Carey wrote his story, and then I I illustrated it. I illustrated it for um, sent for a Vertigo, and we put out sentences. So like I was already at Vertigo though. So like the background, that was the first graphic. And so novel. just for everybody for background, Vertigo was the quote unquote indie hmm. um, author owned imprint of DC Comics. Yeah. So it's part of all of you know, those the things comics. you said should be in yeah. scare quotes. Yes, exactly. I did. I said, quote unquote, did I not? Right, right. Yeah, you did. I'm just saying. Yeah, like, um, yeah. Yeah. So, but it was great because, um, you know, uh, it was great because, like, yeah, you got some weird, you got some weird things that, that came out of it, you know? So, um, and I had done some like fill ins and some covers and, um, you know, uh, kind of culminating in this graphic novel. And I was always kind of um, pitching things. Casey Sejas, the editor on it, um, you know, I would pitch him different things. And I had made like a little, I guess you would call it an ash can, except this comic never got into Prince of Cats. I had made like a 20 something page comic that was just like a Tybalt like character getting into a fight um, and I sold that at Comic Cons and stuff like, 
Um, and so I had made a little something and pitched it, but um, it didn't, it didn't, um, it didn't really go anywhere. And then I, I kind of, I don't want to use the language. I fucked off to do some other things. Like, and at this time it was crazy because the irony is, at this time I, um, I was in Italy as an extra on a Spike Lee movie, which is like a weird, weird part of the story. <laughs> um, yeah, and so uh, it, it came. Um, Casey reached out to me uh, while I was while I was there, and he was like, "Yeah, no, we want to do it." Originally, Oni had reached out, and like Oni was like, "Oh yeah, we could do it as like a series." But I'm like, "Man, how much money? You know, like I'm not going to be able to survive to make this." Even then, I was, you know, a little bit needed to eat. Yeah, Did you need to, to eat? eat? Yeah, Did we were in New pay? York. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, but I felt like the cast of Oni, I was like, I really liked them. And I was a coward at the time. So I got like, I was like, all right, I don't know what to do. That's how I got um, my first agent, Bob Mikoy. Because like, I was a coward and I didn't really want to go to the cast of Oni and be like, bruh, I need more money. So I'm going with Vertigo. Because <laughs> Vertigo reached out. And so like I did. And, well, this is and, right, I think, when we were actually getting to know each other and you mm -hmm. were potentially gonna be working on Trish Trash. So mm -hmm. that you met Bob well, through like, me. Years. It was, no, 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 you know how I met? No, 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 That this was, we met like, no? we met, met like years after this. Well, this must've been 2000, when was, this must've been 2000, the end of 2007. Right around when we met, yeah. Yeah, but I met Bob through uh, Sankey Lee, I believe, cause Sankey, mm. Bob was repping Sankey Lee, who was Spike's younger brother. And that's how I ended up out in Italy. That's the story. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, All right. And, so um, I don't want to, yeah. we're like getting to an hour here and I'm totally fine with talking yeah. some more. No, I'm totally into it, but I, I don't know what you need to do. So I want to make sure we get the story told. Okay. Let me, um, let me zoom through it real quick. So we did it. And yeah. And then are we going to ask questions or something? Yeah. I don't, I, I'm not seeing a lot of questions pop up okay. because you are just answer everything as you go. Okay. All right. Well, I think <laughs> but if anybody has well, questions, now is the time because we're gonna names. the five of y'all in there. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> um, so, so I uh, talking about yeah. this book here. Not even that. Like it was. No, I know. It's there's a smaller version that came out. There was this format. Karen Berger, you know, was editor. You know, Vertigo very grace graciously um, put took a chance on me putting out the book. The book was great. I got to say, I wasn't very excited with how well it was promoted. Um, it, it like sold out like within like a year. I don't, I can't, it sold out so fast. I don't even, it's hard to remember it properly because it was ridiculous. Um, and we didn't get another, we didn't do another printing of it. Uh, so it was out and of And they print. sat on the rights for a really long time, didn't they? Yeah. I mean, I sat on, I think they just like, it was in there. And like, I don't think they were paying much attention to it. So when I, uh, when I reached out to them and also, you know, credit to Bob kind of like staying on them, um, they just released them back to me. And then, I don't know, I was kind of doing some comics, doing comics here and there. Most of my career, I feel like it, I had supplemented it with uh, other types of work, you know, um, design, design work, illustration centered design work. Um, and that's how I was getting the bag was we, we should, we was saying, um, and like some years passed. Oh, I was working. Yo, the way Prince of Cats got made is also a crazy story. Cause I was working on black dynamite when I was wrapping that book up. It was just, it was crazy. Wait, when was, when you when you brought it to Image, you mean, or when you first did it? When I first did it, I okay. completed that book on the road. Yeah. Anyway, so um, a year passes, another year passes. I think like four years pass. I had been kind of knocking on the door at Image, and like you know, through the help of like a bunch of um, friends, Kelly Sue DeConnick was like the the last person i think to try to like get me published by image and so i announced you know i, I announced two books that i have not done and then like <laughs> um at one point eric was like oh we should put out prince of cats again this must have been 2016 i think 
put it out, did great. I think we're on our third or fourth printing now. I don't remember. Um, somewhere between the, I think the second and third printing, um, uh, the Zucker Productions, you know, Janet and Katie particularly reached out to me about shopping it around. Um, they shopped it around like in a year, within a year, like Legendary optioned it. And that was maybe like two years ago, um, maybe two, maybe three years now. I don't know, you know, and then about last year, right before COVID, I turned in the uh, an adaptation that I did with um, Spike um, and then COVID. So Spike happened. Lee is involved in this. He's going to be he's co-writing with you and directing well, we did, or yeah, what's... we did a draft. I mean, look. Part of it's not my story to tell, so I'm not going to tell it. But like we're still in development, and um, Spike and I co-wrote a draft, and that's the last I'll say of it. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Uh, yeah, open yeah, that's loops. The yeah, that's the last I'll say of it. It's like you know, yeah, you're not going to get stuff the scoop is happening. Here. Yeah, maybe stuff is happening. Yeah, yeah, stuff is definitely yeah. happening. So yeah, um, you need to update your get them to update your IMDb, man. It's not even in there. I mean, I'm doing the work. I'll get around to it. Like. You know when I'll update my IMDb when I need a job. <laughs> <laughs> as long as like as long Fair as I'm, as long as I'm working, I really don't care what the general public sees of my life. To keep it hundred with you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's. I mean, I, I'm sure that's true, and like that gets back to the early thing I was talking about of just not. You know, there's a lot of opacity in your various public presences mm. that make it. Um, sometimes hard to pin down, you know, to figure out like where, where to get in touch with you or whatever, mm -hmm. obviously intentionally. Um, but I think it's interesting that you have like four tumblers. I know they're old, you know, you haven't been yeah. updating them in a while, but it's not like you're private in that sense, yeah. you know? No, I mean, but it's like, us having a, like a radio station or something, you know what I mean? That's what it was. It was like really fun. I miss Tumblr, man. Like Tumblr was the best, you know, uh, what are you going to do? Yeah. But yeah, I had a bunch because it's like, it was fun. I go on there. Tumblr reminded me a little bit of the sort of blogs that were out there um, kind of before the internet had been enclosed as much as it had been, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it was like, you know, you could, you could go on there and see someone's weird, you know, vaporwave blog, like posting all of these old animes, you know what I mean? One person's, you know, like, this is why I went. This is why I kind of got this band. It's like someone's doing their little like amateur porn, like someone's doing like, you know, spurries or whatever. You know what I mean? Like everything was on there and it was or someone's like going really deep on like these images. It was it was doing like what a lot of, you know, like a flicker or some other things were trying to do. But they it was like a little bit too, you know, it wasn't flowing as well. And it was just like, man, it was great. So like that's why I did. Yeah. You know, and no one knew. I don't know how many people knew the thing about, yeah. So the most hits I ever got on my tumblers or like my highest thing is just when I posted a bunch of pictures from an indigenous Olympics. They're not there for me or my drawings or nothing. This mm -hmm. post is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people have shared this post. You know what I mean? Like it has nothing to do with my art or nothing. You know what I mean? Like, so that's what I liked about Tumblr. It, it in a way, yeah, it's not necessarily obfuscating like me or who I am, but in a weird sort of way, people can get an idea of like me in a in a more intimate way than like if it's like a press release or like, you know, a list of the things that I've done. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I mean, it's it's not uh, curated in the way your own sort of presented social media is where you're creating images and writing captions and doing, you know, that's a curated view of some sense. It's a mm -hmm. different kind of, like it's you curating other things. Mm -hmm. And then we get, you know, by osmosis, a sense of what your interests are and, mm -hmm. you know, where your paths of research are taking you and all those mm -hmm. kinds of things. So I think, yeah, I mean, there's a, I, I never got the hang of it, <laughs> I gotta say, <laughs> but like, I look you at your tumblers and I think, huh? <laughs> you didn't have enough Yeah, I do time. not have. No, I don't have enough free time. It's true, but um, but look at your tumblers, and I'm I can sort of you can see a thought process, and that's true with the best ones. I think that you can mm -hmm. see, you know, where people are going with stuff. Um, yeah, it's a story. Like yeah. one of them, the Gratin one, I love it because it's like okay, well, even the Prince of Cats one, it's like okay, well, 
here's what Prince of Cats is. Like, actually, here's another here's another way of reading Prince of Cats. Like, just um, you know, like a mood board that you could create. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Sometimes those things are a better. It's like a tasting menu. You know what I mean? It's We're like, back to oh, the okay. end notes in the comics, right? It's like yeah, all the exactly. things you, you want people to know. The context exactly. you want context. You want people yeah. to know all the all the parts that go into it. Yeah, it's a feeling. You know, like it's a vibe. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yes. But also, yeah. You know, but yeah. But it's also, a feeling and a vibe. Thinking. But it also exists in a context and in a world of, mm. you know, like I was reading the latest lab, and you have this thing about the the Chitlin circuit and sort of how mm. there's a black comics mm. equivalent of that in some mm. sense. And then you look at the way, and you also talked about um, the influences of Chinese and Japanese pop culture mm. on you growing up mm. in a different article. And all of these things, when I read them, I go, oh, all of a sudden I get a whole new layer on looking at Prince of Cats, looking at Ratnan. You know, there's all these different things that I now understand in them because I'm under, I'm seeing all that context. Mm. Yeah. I mean, in um, that way, yeah, lab is for lab is for someone, I think, like you. I guess in comics, it's crazy. I think comics must be of all of sort of pop culture mediums, the the medium with the most people participating in making it while also like consuming it <laughs> you know what i mean probably that's what makes comics the way it is and like lab is definitely you know some some of lab is for people who are just like you know oh i just want to read these comics in here or like read these articles but a lot of lab is also just like i don't i'm not even going to slow down and wait for people who aren't making comics or trying to make comics or reading these books um, because my approach, fuck around, my approach to culture even, like, say it could go back to code switching. It's like, it, you know, when I was a kid going from, like, uh, one space to another, like, nobody slowed down and, like, kind of let me know what the references were. Really, it's just, like, I had to be curious and figure the things out, like, try to remember this name, like, try to, you know, and then, like, and to me, I think <clears throat> because, like, how I've kind of found value and in information in that way like i'm sort of uh lab is sort of a um recapitulation might be the word like a re you know like it's a reconstructing what it's like retracing possible. yeah in in one at least in one one thread at least mm -hmm. like, for example the one about um japanese and chinese culture mm -hmm. the pop culture influences mm -hmm you go and, and you try to pull all of these different things that were showing up in your life, mm. you know, and how you encountered them and how they mm. influenced your work, but also how you saw it influencing other things around and how they influenced each other. And you're retracing not everything that influenced you, but mm. one thread of influence through mm. that. Well, kind of like when we were talking before about the Marvel stuff, like, okay, well, what creates that Marvel movie? You know, like, why does it look like a Raytheon commercial, right? Well, it's like, because it's, you know, it's in a world where, you know, that, where that exists as well, right? Like those people who live in this world and this economy produce that because it's like, okay, yeah, they, li you know, they're literally just re, you know, reproducing sort of the world that they live in. And so what I wanted to do with that particular article, um, and is kind of like dig into like, well, why am I as a, you know, like, what does it mean historically to be influenced by these, these other, these other cultures or like this soft power? And like, what does it mean to have these objects come into your space from someplace else where you may or may not have the context even, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and what does it mean for you to try to like, maybe strategically escape your identity or like, how these these like materials influence your identity or sometimes like false friends you know what i mean within your identity and your culture like what does that mean you know like so that's what i wanted to explore that and i kind of just wanted to you know like make it a little bit more complex uh than just like you know i wanted to i wanted to make i wanted to yeah trace the material the history of, of things and maybe you can get a notion of like wow okay this is why this is why ronald thinks this is his sort of perspective on why he ends up producing the things that he has the way he has and like that is information 
that information, like the the process of sort of um, what's the word they use, like when they, you know, for forensics, right? That forensic process is something that I want people to kind of like, you know, like that's something that you can do too, right? Like that's me, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I think it's worthwhile. I mean, imagine applying those forensics to like the Marvel movie, you know, like what might yeah, come up with. For sure. Well, I mean, it's the stuff of PhD theses. Yeah. Yeah. But like it could be plainly, you know, you can you can peep game it as well. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Know. No, I mean, I yeah. think that's <laughs> like you're you live the life, which is like, look, you don't have to do this as a PhD thesis. Right, this can right. be part of your everyday engagement with the world. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I love time, about right? having these conversations. Yeah, it does help to have time. Yes. Research. <laughs> Research. Okay, well, that actually leads us to, we do have a couple questions, and there is a question that's related to this. Hmm. Um, that, let's see, um, when you create a book like Prince of Cats, how many times do you, or in your uh, understanding, other creators intend for it to be read? Like how many times? Like, I don't mean, I don't think it means literally how many times, but you know, there are certain comics that I've made where mm. I expect people to read it basically once. Mm. They don't need to, you know, when somebody reads Life Sucks, they I'm are welcome to read it as many times mm. as they want, but there's not a ton of subtext in there. Mm. You know, there's some, there's a little bit, but it doesn't require multiple readings. Mm. Whereas when you're reading something like, out on the wire, I'm expecting that people are going to want to read it, study it, go back to it, mm. use it multiple times. I think that's kind of what this is about. Mm. And I think, again, if you look at the kind of things we're talking about where you have so much context embedded into works, and but you also just want people to be able to kind of vibe on it. Like, mm. what is your feeling? What is your sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know if this is what um, the person was asking exactly, but like, what do you sort of if you imagine what would be an ideal way of engaging with this as somebody who has never read your work before, what would that be like? I mean, the the simple answer is I have no expectations or I never even think about it. Like, um, I, I, I'm a slow reader, so I want to try to like guess what I think from my own sort of approach to materials. I'm a slow reader and a deliberate reader. So I probably, I imagine that if I subconsciously think or have an answer for that, it would be like, I just probably expect people to slowly go over it. But like, I really, I don't, I don't think about it at all. I don't, I really don't, you know, sometimes. And like the way you, the way you, I think comics are great because the way you can interact with the comic is like the thing that's different about a comic from like a movie or a record or like, I guess Spotify kind of makes music like this a little bit, but not really because, you know, music itself is uh, like your experience of it is like, it requires a sequence, you know, like time. Um, mm -hmm. kind of like just pick it up, flip through it, look through it. You're going to see some pictures like you might go forward, you might go back, you might spoil something for yourself. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, you read it once like, ah, oh, I don't know. I didn't get that. Then maybe you put it on the coffee table or whatever and like put it in the bathroom. Then you pick it up again. Maybe, maybe not, you know, like maybe from maybe you buy it and like your interaction with that book is just looking at the spine for the rest of your life. I don't know. <laughs> I got a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Yo, it's crazy. I pick them up off the street and then I put them down. And then, like, what's nuts is I'll, like, be reading some. I'll completely learn some new stuff. And then I don't realize I had the primary source in my library. It's crazy. Mm. It happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so related question. Do you ever mm. feel like your references and influences in your books are too obvious? Like you're laying stuff really on too thick? I, I mean, I don't, I don't really, I don't really think about it or care. I'm doing it out of joy. <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I don't want it to be, yeah. Like if, if, if it's like, I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be corny, but like, I really can't help what's corny. Like if I do something and somebody else thinks it's corny, it's corny. Sometimes I do, like, I don't want to do, um, 
If if okay, here's the cheat code. <laughs> I'm mostly there's mostly some there's mostly some meaning to it. I'm not doing like uh homages. I'm not into homages or like, you know. It's either it's either I'm doing it because it's like I'm literally copying a master or um there's some meaning to it. You know, I'm not like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if like this was like that it's like no i don't i don't think mixing x with x to create whatever me personally i'm doing there's a meaning to it you know what i mean like it's it's like if you're making a um you're making a sauce or something it's like oh i'm gonna use a little bit of this you know um i'm gonna use a little bit of this coriander and like i'm gonna use this nutmeg or whatever it's like, well, you're not just throwing it in because it's like, yo, coriander and nutmeg. Nobody's done that before. Boom. You know, like, you're like, okay, no, these things mean something new together, right? Like, they create a new experience. Um, and it could be sensual, but usually for me, it's like, it is. It, it has some sort of a narrative meaning. Like, the cover, so for instance, like the cover of Prince of Cats, which is like super obvious. If you're familiar with it, I don't think you need to know about it, but like, it is referring to several different things that are like part of the dna of prince of cats like in a way what i want for people to you know like once they look at like if you're if you're familiar with that it's a sample you know what i mean like it's a sample it's like if you um give us the list what is it referring to uh tadanori yoko's um posters for a yakuza film um uh also it's referencing the first theatrical poster for uh sort of doom um and so you know one is a yakuza reference the other one is a reference to a film about a guy who like is looking for or his path to enlightenment or his path to knowing is through violence and mastery of violence um and then there's like the the bridge as a motif is calling back to the taranori yoko too um so that's it and all of them have their all of them are holding like their sort of like their things that are speaking to their their approach to knowledge you know yeah. I mean, I, that's, I think that answers both those questions. It's both, you can just look at it. It's a cool cover. It looks great. It's attractive. I want to pick up the book. That's what covers are for. And it bears the weight of repeated readings, uh, cultural deep dives, spending time with it, coming back to it, both of those things at the same time, um, which I th think is what you do so well. It's a black, you know what? It's, I'm going to say this, and maybe this is awful. Maybe this is going to diminish people's ability. Oh my God. To, like, really appreciate close it. Your, close your ears. <laughs> but I, like, thinking about the context, one of the things that I, I care about or that I think about, and one of the things I got from school, like this um, teacher, uh, Pasalak, where I had at Pratt, was he always was like, you know, you're doing this thing, but you're part of like a, a continuum, you're part of a lineage, right? And people have been doing what you're doing and like you're going to do things and people are going to it's going to keep moving. And that's how I think about sometimes this particular type of work. I think about sampling. Like I think about the blues. I think about jazz. So it's like. Um, Doom has this one song. Um, is it is it is it fake fried friends or something? Something like that. And he's got like he's got like. Um, He's got two samples. One of them is uh, friends. How many of us have them by um, Jesus Christ? I'm getting old because my memory. Like this is an obvious. This is an obvious track. Um, and the other one is, I think it's lovers and, and strangers. Anyway, don't hold me accountable because I can't remember. And one of the guys just died last year. One of the from the first record, but it's like. If you know those records, one, there's like a there's a vibe that you get from like 
having experienced those records in another space and it adds like a spatial quality to the music and also like a meta context you know what i mean and it goes down to the language you know what i mean so two as well and i think that's part of a tradition that i find myself in just accidentally but also deliberately like in in the end it's like i want to go back and i want to do you know i want to do that type of stuff i always think about sonny rollins and like um mac the knife you know like i think about kind of taking one thing flipping it sampling it and like what does it what does it mean you know like for me because how i experience it is like wow okay 20 well not even 20 like 1998 99 or whatever or like whenever i first listened to that sonny rollins record and then like many many years later i'm like uh, you know oh the you know like it's the three penny opera and like oh well it's connected to you know this type of theater oh and these songs are you know it's like holy shit <laughs> it changes you know like it your mind explodes <clears throat> and it gives yes. just a lot of meaning and context to it and also it's just a bop you can throw it on and it's nice but it's also about a guy who's like a you know <laughs> a murderer you know, <laughs> yeah. and a, a play, a play from like a play that's that a play that has a relationship to the greatest tragedies of the 20th century, <laughs> you know, like it's just, yeah, you know, anyway, so that's context and yeah. pure enjoyment at yeah. the same time. Yeah, Houdini, thank you. It was Houdini. <laughs> um and thank you frank uh, um is it is it strangers something in strangers well, i can't remember the name of that record either but anyway so i got one last question for you and then we're going to wrap it up um so do you see yourself as a comic book artist and creator first and everything else as a bonus or vice versa or is it all equal or is there some other way um wait a minute uh I'm not the I'm not the first person to think of like sampling and writing or you know or even that sort of thing too. I think um like people have been doing weird sh stuff like that. Gertrude Stein, like people have been doing lots of weird stuff, like taking visual motifs or practices and putting them into you're writing. part of a tradition and carrying it on and other people are gonna follow you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um there's this this book right here. Uh Louise Kamnitzer, I don't even think like I I read just a little bit of this book, but I listened to a um, I think I listened to a, a an interview with him on Eflux, and he was talking about he's a printmaker at one point, and then he stopped being a um, well he started to get into other things, and then he kind of had that epiphany about like okay he's an artist who works in different mediums. That's like how I would answer that question, you know, like I'm an artist who works in like I'm an artist and like. I don't want to say I'm like a, like, yeah, I always, whenever, whenever I'm about to say something that I think is really conceited, I just see a picture of Napoleon putting the crown on himself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Every time, like it never, it never fails. I think that's, is it David or Ang? Like, he's like, he's like, Ugh. but I think like, uh, I, I think of myself as like an artist and a philosopher first who has different mediums of working uh working out things asking myself questions with whatever medium and i don't you know like i don't i don't really think of uh myself as a cartoonist works when i put it out there it's like that's something that i do you know yeah i hear you i've done it a lot um yeah so last uh question is not a question but it's, it's a statement my friend frank who's here live and is helping us out with sample information he says he has a milk and cheese board game and do we want to come over and play <laughs> where though <laughs> we're, we're here very... in philly come visit me possibly but i gotta say this and a lot of people are not gonna want to hear this but like board games have like a a, a are a double entendre for me 
I'll just, Did I just open a can of worms? I don't. No, I'm just saying like board <laughs> games. It's like I'm always bored when I'm playing them. Like oh, I do not. Yeah. The, I'm not into board. I got almost got. I don't think I got it. I almost got that um that that board game that uh, Gita board did like it's like some sort of weird game of chess and i was like i'm not gonna why am i gonna spend all this money on this i'm never gonna play it you know, <laughs> you know? yeah here yeah still come and visit okay yes please i i'll you know i got a driver's license now i'm trying Whoa. to get a, yeah i'm trying to get like a um bike license you know <laughs> billy's not too far for a bike ride no it's close yeah it's a few hours away too yeah. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this up and we still have a bunch of people here live. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, I uh, really appreciate it. Really appreciate that you're sticking around. We had such a good time. Um, remember, we're going to have another episode just next week, one week from today with um, painter and printmaker Didier William. Uh, he's going to talk about his path to success teaching growing up gay in the Haitian diaspora community in Miami. You can register for that now at our Crowdcast channel. If you, when we're done here, if you just hit my name at the top, you can hit Jessica Abel and uh, you'll get to our Crowdcast channel and sign up there and get new, get updates. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for being here. I'm really, it was such, so much fun to have an excuse to hang out with you, Ron. Hey, Ronald, uh, sorry. <laughs> Ronald. You can call me Ron. Y'all can't call me Ron, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys, don't call him Ron. <laughs> All right. Ronald Wimberly, it's been a yeah. pleasure and an honor. No, it's always, always a pleasure. Next time, uh, tete a tete. I'll have, I got my shots. I hope y'all get your shots too. You know. We got our shots. Yeah. I hope everybody yeah. here's got their shots. And mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Next time, next time in person. Yes. All right. All right. See you. Bye bye.